we're going to continue our journey through 2 Corinthians. And uh, we've reached uh, chapter 5. And uh, we're going to be looking at verses 11 to 21. We'll come to those in a moment. But I just wonder, have you ever read something that has really impacted you? Perhaps it was a, a story about somebody achieving something that, uh, against all the odds, a real from adversity to ecstasy story. You know, one of those kind of, a, you know, they make a movie out of it, don't they? And uh, the person su succeeds at the end. You could think of maybe Rocky or any kind of those movies from, from a place of nowhere to somewhere. Or perhaps you've seen something on the, the television. Um, you know, we've all seen things like comic relief and charity and that's where they show you pictures and, and videos of certain circumstances. And they do this to get us to act, don't they? To get it to, to motivate us, to pull up maybe our, our heartstrings, our emotions a little bit. Perhaps you're a, a follower of Jesus this morning here, and I know a number of you are. We are doing the same when we share the good news. We are trying to encourage people to act. And we're going to explore what that means in a moment. Maybe you're watching online, maybe you're sitting here today and you are, you are, you have stopped, you've never stopped to think about God. Or perhaps you actually uh, don't like religion at all. Perhaps you're watching online with the intention of being proven right that your 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 dislike of, of church and of religion is justified or perhaps you've been dragged to church here this morning with no expectation or perhaps you're here or watching online just being open to exploring what faith is Perhaps you've been a Christian for a long time. You're a follower of Jesus and you're sitting here perhaps wondering, is there more to my faith than this? Am I doing everything God has called me to do? Perhaps you're bored as a follower of Jesus. Perhaps you don't know what your role is. Well, this week, as I read these 11 verses that we're going to look at in 2 Corinthians, I, I just saw the answers to everything. I don't know, that, that sounds dramatic. I've, I've said to a few people this week that I've, that I've spoken to, and I feel that these 11 verses really encapsulate so much of the good news, so much of what it means to be a Christian, so much of what it means to become a Christian. I was, I, I did a little video that we put out on Facebook because I was so excited about these verses and I hope that just in that little moment there of, of setting the scene, of asking you some questions, it's got you thinking. Alongside the gospel, we will see what the gospel means in these verses. We'll, they talk about the, the motivation of the Apostle Paul, a motivation that I believe that we should all share. We'll also see a little bit about um, the motivation of God, what he wants, of how God acted to enable the possibility of everyone to be reconciled to him. So let's just dive in. We're going to read these 11 verses straight off. And then we're going to unpack them a little bit together. So this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 11. Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope that it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to command our, commend ourselves to you again, but I'm giving you the opportunity to take pride in us. So that you answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one 
died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. And all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, if the truth be told, we can spend weeks unpacking these 11 verses. We could, I could preach for two hours, you know, a Nigel length sermon, but I'm not going to. We're just going to pull out a few bits this morning, because I just want us to get a sense of the power of these 11 verses. So let's talk a little bit about motivation. What, what is motivating Paul? Well, there are actually two elements of, I, I believe, a motivation in these verses. Paul's motivation, motivation, which is very explicit, and we'll look at that in a moment, and God's motivation, which maybe is a little bit more implicit. Paul was motivated by the love of Jesus. Now, put the Apostle Paul, let's just remember, he, he's responsible for a lot of the, 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 the letters in the New Testament. He wasn't always a follower of Jesus. He had that Damascus Road experience. And he became an apostle to the Gentiles, to the, the people who weren't Jewish. And he went out shouting about and sharing about the good news of Jesus, remembering that this was a man that, before he met Jesus, was more concerned with imprisoning people who were Christians. But Paul was motivated by the love of Jesus. Verse 14, the first part of verse 14 said, For Christ's love compels us. And actually, we need to break that down into two parts almost. Paul was motivated in two ways Christ's love for him, a love that Christ has for everyone, and his love for Christ. If you don't know Jesus, if you're sitting here this morning in the room and you don't know Jesus, you haven't entered into a relationship with him, or you're watching online just to see what this church thing is about, I want you to know right now that Jesus loves you. And we can't get our heads around what that means. And you may be sitting there thinking, you don't know what I've done, Adam. It's so bad. How can Jesus love me? Well, I promise you, Jesus loves you. And we're going to look a little bit more about why we need, why we need to know God and know Jesus in a few moments. But if you do know Jesus... If you have been a, a Christian, I've been a Christian for ooh, about 22 years. That would make me 25, no. Uh, uh, I've been a Christian for 22 years. And sometimes we just drift a little bit, don't we? And we forget how much he loves us. I don't know, I've been married for 21 years. I know that's right. And I've been married for 21 years. And so, you know, I remember when I, I first met Ruth, I didn't like her. But uh, she grew on me and I grew on her. And uh, I remember I would come out of work. I used to work in London at the time and uh, I worked for the NHS. So we couldn't have our phones on in the hospital. That were the days when your Nokia would 
do for somebody in intensive care if you weren't careful, and because uh, it would affect all the, the things. And so we had to switch our phones off. And I'd come out of work, and uh, I, I was quite close to the station. I'd switch my phone on, and with anticipation of the text from Ruth, she would always text me when she finished work. She was a teacher, so you know, she finished at three. And, um, and, uh, she, and you know, because I, I was in love. And I was excited. You know, but now, if she texts me, I'm like, oh no, now what have I done wrong? <laughs> or if I'm shopping, oh, please don't tell me I've got to go to the other end of the supermarket to get something we've just remembered. It's like that when we become Christians, isn't it? We were excited. I remember when I became a Christian and I met the, the minister of the church we were going to. I remember walking home, just having spent time talking about being baptized with her. And I was just, I felt like I was floating down the road. Now they've said I can't walk around today. And I'm looking at all those wires. I'm not going to try because I'm going to fall over. But I was just excited. I was in love with Jesus and so much. But can I tell you the truth? I've had my ups and downs over the years, ups and downs as a pastor. There are moments when I've forgotten how much God loves me. I needed to remind myself of that. Not because of anything God's done, but because of how I am. So remember, if you are a Christian, think back to that time for some of you that will be recent for others it will be a long time ago but just remember how you felt when you met Jesus for the first time you know God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us and if we just think about that those of you that have got children could you send one of them to die for somebody else he sent his son to die for us because he wants us to be reconciled to him that is God's motivation he wants us to be in a right relationship with him he wants us to be reconciled to him that's what's motivating God. Verse 18, again, the start of it says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. That is what God wants. He wants us to be restored to a right relationship. And we'll see why we need to be restored in a moment. But um, I was reading, uh, uh, when I was kind of preparing my message, I read a... Uh, some, some comments from a, an author called David Garland and he notes how the word reconciliation is personal reconciliation denotes a relationship God wants a relationship with each one of us it's not something standoffish you know we often when we when we if you've been in church for a while you've heard the word justified where we've been made right with God because of what Jesus did on the cross and that's important but that's almost a bit transactional in nature reconciliation is more intimate it's more personal and that's what God wants he wants a personal relationship with each one of us and we can't get our heads around how God can do that with every, for everybody in the world but that's what he wants God wants a relationship with each one of us. If you don't know God, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he wants you to be reconciled to him, to have that relationship with him. If you have been a Christian for one week, ten weeks, or ten years, he wants a deeper relationship with you. But why do we need to be reconciled? Well, verse 19, the start of it says this. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them now this isn't the clearest picture of the gospel you've got to take this letter in the context of the whole, whole bible not counting people's sins against them that, you see sin is the thing 
that drives a wedge in our relationship with God. Sin against God causes separation. And I've said it before and I'll say it again and it offends people every time I say it. We all sin. We've all done things that have damaged our relationship with God. We do things every day, unfortunately, that damage our relationship with God. Sometimes we do it without realising it. Sometimes we do it knowingly. Look around the world. Look around what we see going on and we see that sin, sadly, is rampant in the world. But God had a plan and has a plan. You see, sin requires punishment. If we do something wrong, and you know if you speed and get caught, then there's going to be a punishment for that. You're going to get points on your license or have to go on one of those driver awareness courses. If you walk into a bank and rob it, you're going to go to prison. Sin, wrongdoing, requires a punishment. Now, the punishment that, that God brings down for sin is eternal separation from him. That's called hell. It's not a pleasant place. But God doesn't want that for us. He wants us to be restored, to be reconciled to him. God doesn't want any of us to go to hell. So he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and take the punishment that we deserve. Our sins not counted against us. But I need to caveat that. Caveat that. To be reconciled, we must accept what, who Jesus is and what he did for us. On the cross. John 3, verses 16 17. Certainly, John 3 16, one of the most famous verses in the Bible. But let's just read these two verses. And I realize I've labeled them up wrong on the slide, so don't worry about that. <laughs> For God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. If we believe in Jesus, if we accept him as our Lord and Saviour, then we will not be condemned. Our sins will not be counted against us. That's God's plan. That's how we get reconciled to God because Jesus took the punishment that we deserve. And for those of us that who for those of us who do believe, Paul says the following. And he committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are there, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as through God, as though God were making his appeal through us. Just as Paul was committed by God to share the message of reconciliation, so are we. You see, there is more to being a Christian than just coming to church on a Sunday morning. There's even more than going to Nigel's life group. We are called to be Christ's ambassadors. And when you think of an ambassador, it's not just giving out forever or shame. We're called to be Christ's representatives, to be God's representatives wherever we are. And we've spoken about this so many times. One of our... our um, our vision statement that we forgot to put the banner up this morning, but it talks about transforming communities. We can extend that to say transforming workplaces, to transforming schools, colleges, universities. 
And we do that by being Christ's ambassadors, by being his witnesses where we are. We're called to represent Jesus with our actions and with our words, with our behaviours. We're called to be different. You know, if you represent this, people will ask you why you do what you do. What makes you different? Why, why do you behave the way? Why don't you gossip? Why don't you complain? We are called to lead the charge for reconciliation, for people to be restored into a personal relationship with God. What is going to solve the problems of this world? It is no politician. They are flawed. Whatever uh, party they are from, they are flawed. But the world being reconciled to God, you and me being good ambassadors for Christ, will lead to change in your street, in your house, in your job, in your community. You see, that's part of what the, the living room is about. It's about being Christ's ambassadors. It's about being there, about showing Jesus' love for people. And when people are reconciled, what happens? We become a new creation. Death loses its sting. We have hope beyond the here and now. That's what got me. You see, I remember sitting on a train outside Waterloo East train station in London having done another nine to five for the NHS and just sitting there thinking, there must be more to life than this. Getting up, going to work, coming home, having just about enough money to pay the bills and just repeating that. And I just, I couldn't imagine myself, or I couldn't imagine that being it for the next 30 or 40 years, however long I had to work. There had to be more to life than this. And there is more to life than this. It's called Jesus. And we are called to be reconciled. That is our ministry. We are blessed with people in this church who are brilliant at standing outside. We, when we go and do the, the band setting, I'm not going to name people because I don't want to embarrass them. But they are brilliant at talking to people. One of them, we thought we'd lost last time. We had to text them and tell them that they pursued somebody into a shop in, in a good way because that person wanted to know a little bit more about what they were talking talking about. And that's what we're called to do. That's our ministry. If you're sitting there thinking, I'm a bit bored of this Christian stuff and, you know, is it just coming to church on a Sunday? No. Now you don't have to go and stand outside the bandstand with us on a Saturday morning and and do that. But you, you just you need to be a good witness for Christ wherever you are. You see, if you get up every morning and you say to God, God, just give me an opportunity to be a good witness for you, then life gets more and more exciting. People will come to you and talk to you. Random things will happen. God coincidences will happen. We are instructed. To be reconcilers. Something's just come to me that, that I haven't written down. Something we're not called to be is judges. We're called to be reconcilers. We are not called to be judges. I don't know. I'm going to leave that there. That may hit home with somebody. It's not, we'll just let it go. So how do we apply this to our lives? Well, are you sitting here this morning and do you need to remember how much Jesus loves you? 
has that faded? Has that excitement of your first meeting with him faded over time? Do you need to grow as an ambassador for Christ? Do you need to start getting up every morning and saying, God, give me an opportunity to be a good ambassador for you? Or are you sitting here or are you watching online and realise that you have never been reconciled to God and you need to do that right now? That you need to give your life to God. You need to put your trust in who Jesus was, the Son of God. That he came and died for your sins, took the punishment that you deserve and rose from the dead. Defeating death, you see, that's what the enemy has. His weapon, his big thing is death, eternal separation from God. We have hope as followers of Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus now, if you haven't accepted him, if you haven't got that hope, I'm going to invite you to make that decision this morning. To accept him into your life as your Lord and Saviour. And to set out on a journey. Now, some people worry, you know, I'm not good enough. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. None of us are good enough. We all have our flaws and our foibles. I still irritate Ruth immensely. She's not nodding. Or actually nodding. I was nodding. You don't annoy me. I don't annoy you. Oh. I still do stupid things. But I know that I'm a child of God. Doesn't excuse some of my behaviours. But I'm a child of God. And how we start that journey here is we give you the opportunity to pray and accept Jesus into your life as your Lord and Saviour. And we do that, I will say a few lines of a prayer and if you want to accept him in your heart you follow on you, you repeat those words either out loud or in your heart at home if you're watching online it's the start of a journey a lifelong journey we will never be perfect we can never we could never earn our way into heaven we will never be 100% Perfect. I'm 99.9. I'm pleased with that. I'm not. But we have an advocate for us in Jesus. Someone who paid the price. So if you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour this morning, I'm going to invite you to follow me in this prayer. Let's close our eyes, bow our heads. You can do that at home, but nobody can see you as well, so you're okay. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner, that I have done things that have damaged my relationship with you. And I'm sorry. Help me to turn away from those things now. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. For taking the punishment that I deserve. Thank you that Jesus defeated death and rose again three days later. I want to accept Jesus 
as my Lord and Saviour. Come and guide me in my life. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you've just, if we keep our eyes closed for a few moments and our heads back, if you've said that for the first time today in this room or online, I'd love you to raise your hand just so we know and we can pray with you afterwards and we can bring you a Bible. If you've said it at home, please message us and we will be with you. Maybe you've just, that's a recommitment for you as well, a, a refresh. Okay, we can open our eyes with that.